to Developmental Psychology Unit 6. In this unit, we'll be discussing linguistic development. Now, when we talk about language, it's important to understand that language is a symbolic structure that can be spoken, written, or signed. And so to help us out with this unit, we're going to break it down into those three different sections of how we develop a sense of spoken language, signed language, and written language. For most of us, the first type of language to develop is, of course, our spoken language. So that's where we're going to start. So talking about spoken language, what we're talking about is the language we can hear and the language we can speak. And so this is basically the auditorial part of language. This is the part of language that we don't see, but comes through sound waves or comes through telephones, baby monitors, or through microphones. Now, although humans are definitely capable of developing very elaborate spoken languages, it's important to note that we need to be exposed to these languages during the critical and sensitive periods. What this means is that if we're not exposed to certain elements of a spoken language within the first year or the first five years of life, it's going to weaken our ability to be completely fluent in those aspects of the spoken language. For, so for most of us, we're doing a lot of work in getting a spoken language in the first year of life. And so not having that exposure is really going to set us back or make some of the capabilities impossible for us down the road. When we're talking about the critical period, we're talking about that really, really essential period in the first year of life that we absolutely need to be exposed. Whereas when we're talking about the sensitive period, there's a little bit more flexibility. The sensitive period, it's good to be exposed to certain parts of language, but if we're not exposed, we may be able to learn those later on. The sensitive and critical periods do overlap, but it's important to note that early exposure matters. Now, when we're talking about spoken language, there's lots of different areas we can look at from a linguistic point of view. In fact, in the science of linguistics, we can look at things like studying the phonemes or studying exactly the different sounds we make when we communicate orally. Or we can talk about semantics, which is the lexicon or vocabulary or meaning behind the words. Or we can talk about grammar, which is the science of how we connect the different pieces of spoken language to give it meaning and to give it new flexibility. And we can talk about the pragmatics, which is more of the social nuance and social norms around our language and how we use oral language in a social setting. So we're going to talk about all four of these areas and we're going to go through starting off with phonemes. So phonemes are parts of the sounds of language. In fact, a phoneme is considered to be the smallest unit of sound in a language. This is not the same as a word and it's not the same as a syllable. A word can be made up of many sounds. In fact, most words that are more than one letter long have multiple sounds, therefore would have multiple phonemes. Even a word that only has one syllable, or that we can say it in sort of one beat, will have multiple phonemes in most cases. Let's take, for instance, the word cat. The word cat is one word, and it's one syllable word. We think about the word catnip as having two syllables or two parts. Now, although the word cat is said in one syllable, it has three distinct phonemes. It has three distinct sounds that we can break down from cat. It has the ka, a, t, ka, a, t. Now we say cat all at once in one syllable and cat nip goes together for one larger word, but even in nip, that's one syllable that has three separate phonemes, n, i, k. And so it's three different sounds. There are some sounds that in the English lexicon are made up of two or more letters. For instance, the phoneme th, we cannot break down into a separate t versus h sound. Whereas other combinations and other blendings we can break down. Think of the combination of br in the word bread or break. We can actually break that down to b, r, ed, bread. We can break down the B and the R noises. So those would be considered two phonemes versus a TH we can't break down. A CH ch, 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 doesn't break down into a further C and H sound. And even some things like the N and G at the end of the word sing. It, you might not have, we might struggle with that one a little bit more because the G is actually something pulling at the back of our throat, more of a guttural mm to it. And so we're, the N is really where we're placing our tongue and how that's affecting the nasal noise of the sound versus the G is really deeper down in our throat for ng. Mm. And so that's one sound we can't break down into the N and G. And so a phoneme is the smallest unit of sound in a spoken language. And so understanding being aware of these phonemes goes into the science of phonological awareness. Phonological awareness is a really important skill that we have in our language development. This is something we commonly see in kids when we're teaching them how to rhyme words. We're listening to the ending phoneme 
or we're getting them to match which words begin with similar letters, we're getting them to listen to the starting phoneme of a word. And so phonemes is something that are very essential to our linguistic development. And it's something that starts off really early in our lifespan. For instance, when we are first born, in the first two months of life, we don't really produce phonemes yet. In fact, when newborns are giggling or trying to make noise, they're not really using their vocal cords. Rather, it's more the pushing of air. This may be too hard to hear, but I'll try to demonstrate. With very little vocal cord stimulation. Once we get around two months of age, we begin what's known as cooing. And this happens to all infants, regardless of culture and regardless of ethnic background. What happens here is we begin to coordinate our brain to our vocal cords where now we can make the vowel sounds. And so it's not just the vowel sounds in your language spoken at home that you make, it's all possible vowel sounds, whether they exist in your culture or not. And so these are just strings of vowel sounds. To demonstrate what a two month old may begin to sound like, it could be something like That'd be a demonstration with no consonants, but just vowel sounds. And it would just be a string of vowel sounds. Then as we get a little bit older, roughly around six months of age, this is when the brain's pathway to the lips and the tongue begin to mature. And now instead of just vowels, we can begin to make consonants. The big difference between vowels and consonants here is a vowel doesn't really rely on the lips and the tongue versus consonants absolutely do. And so there's some consonants that develop a little bit earlier, regardless of culture, regardless of language spoken at home. And those tend to be our M, our B and our D noises. It's easier for our lips and tongue to make those. And what happens in babbling is we begin to babble all possible noises, even if they don't exist in our culture, and we do it repetitively. So in demonstration of early babbling around six months of age, it might be something like all sorts of different noises. Now, as we go on from six months to nine months of age, we begin to selectively repeat the noises we hear more often in our environment. What happens here is we begin to drop the consonant sounds that don't exist in the language spoken at home. And so there's some noises like an R or an L or a hard H like H, huh, then we may not use those if we don't hear them around us. So you can think about how in Spanish there's a rolling R or in some languages G's or TH's may look a little bit different. In fact, in French, we know all H's are silent. And so if those noises are not heard around us, we will begin to drop them. Important to understand is at this point, cooing and babbling is completely nonsensical. We're not actually making sense of anything and putting words behind this. So even if an infant is saying mum, 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 they're not actually meaning their mother or da, 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 ba, 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 ba. They're not saying parents or bottles. And it's completely nonsensical. And it's practicing before we're ready to actually produce words with meaning. So aside from cooing and babbling, what's also been happening and tends to get a lot stronger around nine months of age is our use of intonation. We've definitely been practicing this since two months, but around nine months of age, this starts to get a little bit clearer. And this is when the babbling starts to have both a rising and a lowering intonation. So intonation is the type of tone you have in your voice. Prosody is also related to intonation, and it's the idea of whether you sound a little bit more happy or a little bit more disappointed in your tone of voice. For instance, just to demonstrate this with babbling that has no meaning, we could say something like ba 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 ba. And so you could have where it goes up ba 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 or down ba 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 ba. And a sentence that ends with a lowering intonation ba 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 makes us sound like we're concerned or there's something we're not enthusiastic about versus ba 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 tends to be something we're very enthusiastic about and something that makes us happy. Infants actually start to recognize this when their parents use rising and lowering intonations. And infants will actually learn that their parents feel more positive about something when they mention it with a rising intonation, and they feel more negative about something if they talk about it with a lowering intonation. Now, when we talk about different accents and different dialects, it's important to understand intonation can work differently in different cultures, and the emphasis you put on some words can work differently. And we will start to become selective and sensitive to that around nine months of age. 
Another big thing we have to understand with developmental psychology is it's not just about gaining skills, sometimes it's about losing skills. And around the first birthday, around 12 months of age, our phonological awareness actually becomes more limited. It becomes more restrictive. And that's because we experience perceptual narrowing. This is synaptic pruning, where it trims the pathways and the awareness to hear different phonemes that we're not exposed to. We know that infants that are around six months of age, they can hear any phoneme that exists in any culture around the world. But by the time they're 12 months of age, they can only hear and distinguish between the phonemes that exist in the language they're exposed to. And we can do this with computers, and we can make a B sound that gradually turns into a P sound. I can't demonstrate it, but we can artificially do it on a computer, where you go ba 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 and if we ask an adult, is that a B or a P, they have to completely map them into both, but there might be some really ambiguous sounds in the middle that are really hard for adults to process. They say, well, that's, that's not a B or a P. We can do the same thing with T's and D's. And adults will not be able to really make sense of the sounds in the middle, or a V and an F. I'm completely just switching because my brain has completely been pruned. I am not sensitive to the sounds that exist between these letters in the English language. However, an infant who is only around six months of age, regardless of what home environment they have, regardless of where they live in the world, they would be able to identify and distinguish between that middle sound and they would be able to be sensitive to it. And if they were exposed to a language that made use of a sound that existed between T and D or a sound that existed between B and P, they could continue to use that and be sensitive to it for the rest of their lifespan. This is why if you're exposed to multiple sounds of D, such as those that are spoken in Nepal, or multiple H sounds, this is those spoken in Israel, or multiple types of C sounds, then you're gonna be main sensitive to those. Now these are consonants, it gets even more tricky with vowels. And if you're not exposed to some vowel differences early on in your lifespan, you can lose that sensitivity. And that can lead to the really embarrassing moment where you try and say someone's name and they're like, no, it's not right. And they repeat their name to you multiple times your brain can't process it. You empathetically want to get their name right, but it's using a vowel sound that you're not familiar with and your brain doesn't have the capacity to pick up. Your brain can get it with lots of practice, but it is quite effortful and not automatic. And so this leads us down the road of culturally selective perception. We become more perceptive to the sounds that exist in our culture. So phonological awareness and phonological development is really fascinating. And what really matters here is early exposure. And that's why the critical and sensitive periods matter. If you want someone who's going to be able to be fluent in multiple languages or even be sensitive to other sounds in other languages, we really need that early exposure.